This morning, and actually this evening, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at verse 21, but of course we want to bring in what the surrounding verses also have uh, to tell us. So what I'd like to do is begin reading in verse 19 of 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll read to the end of the chapter. Uh, we are going to begin by looking at... Um, the, the calling that the Lord has placed upon our lives, uh, particularly the calling to suffer. But we're going to begin by looking at the example that we are to follow, which is the example that Jesus has given to us. So again, beginning in verse 19 of 1 Peter 2, Peter writes, For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrow, when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if, when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed." For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. May the Lord bless again his word to our hearing this morning and to our building up in the Lord Jesus. Now, Peter, as I've already mentioned, tells us in our text that the Lord has placed uh, a, what we might call a rather unusual calling upon our lives. He calls us to suffer. This, this goes so contrary, doesn't it, to... Uh, at least some movements within the church and perhaps the mindset of the broad evangelical church which pretty much teaches that once you come to Christ everything is resolved, your problems are over, all your cares and concerns are over. Um, you're going to be healthy, wealthy and happy and that's the way it's going to go. But it isn't necessarily that way. Now the Lord, or I should say Peter, by the, the inspiration of the Spirit is not necessarily telling us that we won't have any joy because we will have joy. The Bible says we'll have joy unspeakable and full of glory. And he isn't saying that we won't be blessed. We'll actually experience the greatest blessings. I would say, humanly speaking, the most blessed person on earth besides our Lord Jesus Christ was Paul. And yet he was the one who suffered more than anyone else. Okay, He's not saying we won't experience these things, but he is saying we will suffer. Sometimes we'll suffer a little, sometimes we'll suffer a lot. Maybe it won't be constant, but it will be, I suppose, consistent. At least it will, to the degree that we live according to the Lord's will, as Jesus calls us to live. Peter tells us in verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose. He says this is the reason why we were called into the kingdom of heaven. And what is that purpose? We find it in the previous verse, verses 20 and 21. Peter says, but if, you, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God, for you have been called for this purpose. And what Peter is telling us is essentially this, that when we do what our Lord has called us to do, when we push forward towards Moral perfection, not physical perfection, but the character of Christ, the moral perfection, as Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 4, excuse me, 5, verse 48, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. When you press towards that perfection, when we try to honor the Lord in all the choices that we make, as Paul tells us that we should in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, where he says, whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When we become more like Jesus, as the Father 
predestined us to become, as Paul writes in Romans 8.28, 829, excuse me, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. When we pursue these things, we will draw attention from the world, as we were reminded by Dr. Ferguson, but not the kind of attention that we usually want or at least think of desiring. We usually want to draw the attention of others so they can see you know, our accomplishments and maybe praise us for it. But what we will draw is not praise, but rather hatred. Jesus says in John 15, verse 19, if you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You see, that's the kind of attention doing what Jesus calls us to do is going to draw. They will hate us, and they will hate us because they hated him. He says in verse 18 of that same chapter, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. The world hated Jesus. And by the way, Jesus is talking about the world here. He's referring to the Jews who were his Old Covenant people, they were the church. They were the ones who were hating him, but it would have applied to the rest of the world as well. They hated him because he was different, because he was morally perfect. And if we pursue moral perfection, they're going to hate us as well. Well, Peter tells us that we must be willing to endure this hatred and that we must do so patiently. This is what we are called to. He says, this is what finds favor with God. This is what pleases Him. If in the pursuit of these things, we suffer. Now, why does that please God? Because when we do this and we suffer, and we suffer in the way we should suffer, we show that we are going the right direction, that we are following Jesus. As a matter of fact, it, it's, it's almost a confirmation you know, we don't just think we're doing it, but the world thinks we're doing it. It shows, you see. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. When we suffer for doing what is right, we show that we are following the example Jesus gave to us. We are walking in His steps. Now, to bring the kingdom of heaven into this world and to bring us into that kingdom to save us from the consequences of our sins, which is an eternity in hell under the punishment of God's wrath, Jesus had to suffer. Jesus loved us enough in order to go through this suffering. The example that we are to follow is, is essentially what Jesus did in order to bring us into the kingdom of heaven, what he did for us, the love that he showed for us. Now, that's what we want to look at this morning. We want to see that Jesus suffered. We want to see what it is he suffered. We want to see how it is he suffered and, and why he did. This evening, we're going to look at where we began, which is how we are called to follow this same example. Let me just... Um, I say this to begin with because this is really going to be the entire point of the day. Jesus had to suffer in order to save us. He had to suffer in order to bring the kingdom into this world. But we must be willing to suffer if the kingdom of heaven is to advance because the kingdom really only advances through suffering of one form or another. So let's look at the sufferings of Jesus to begin with. First of all, Jesus had to suffer to bring his kingdom into this world and to bring us into that kingdom. Now, that suffering was really made necessary because of the situation that we fell into originally. And here I just want to contrast what Adam would have had to do in order to give us life versus what Jesus had to do to give us life. Because Adam could have brought life to us, hypothetically, without any suffering at all. Adam was made perfect. We know that Adam had a perfect heart. 
He desired nothing other than to serve God. He didn't have to fight with himself in order to do that. He was placed in a perfect world where there was no sickness and there was no death because there was no sin. There was nothing to drag him down. There was nothing to get in his way. All Adam had to do, essentially, was to do what God called him to do. It was relatively simple. Cultivate the garden. Take care of it. Keep the garden. That is, protect it. Protect it from any intruders. The garden was God's sanctuary. And anybody who comes in who wasn't supposed to be there, Adam was supposed to throw him out. And he was not supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if Adam had done these things, if he had kept the garden, if he had protected the garden, if he had repelled Satan when he came, as Jesus later would do when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, um, instead of listening to him and doing what he suggested, if he had repelled the enemy, he would have lived forever. We would have lived forever with him. We would have done the work the Lord called him to do of multiplying, filling, subduing the earth without any suffering. We would have had a heart full of love towards the Lord. We never would have gotten sick or weak. We would never suffer. We would never die. So we might say, relatively speaking, Adam's job was easy. All he had to do what was, is, was what was already in his heart to do, what he wanted to do. All he had to do was obey God. But, as you know, he didn't obey. And as we know, his disobedience changed things. It brought that perfect world under God's curse so that now, not only does it resist our efforts to subdue it to the glory of God, but our hearts resist as well. We don't want to do it. And on top of that, we have all the other problems associated with the curse, weakness, sickness, aging, suffering, and death. And we live in a world that hates God. And the world also hates one another. You know, Jesus did say on one occasion, even sinners love those who love them. That's true. But what about those who, that hate them? They hate those people that hate them. They love their neighbor as long as their neighbor is doing what they want them to do. But if their neighbor doesn't do what they want them to do, then they hate them. This is the kind of world that we're in. Now, since the world is in this kind of condition, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of redemption, could not come. And his people could not be brought into it without suffering. The wages of sin is death, Paul reminds us in Romans 6.23. And so in order to bring us life, the second Adam, Jesus had to suffer and he had to die. So what we want to look at now is what our redemption cost Jesus by way of suffering. Now, we've heard many sermons about the sufferings of the cross, but I, I, and that is the apex of his sufferings. But I wanted to broaden it out just a little bit and to see some of the other things that Jesus suffered in order to save us because remember he did this out of love and he did this for you if you're trusting him and this is the only way you could have been saved but also this is the example that we are called to follow now Jesus sufferings really began with his descent into this world when he became a man and that is also a way in which Jesus suffered Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, talking about Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Now, we might not think that that's such a great condescension because we're human beings, and we don't think it's so bad to be a human being. But let's remember who it is that actually became a man here. One who was in his very form God, the eternal Son of God, who by definition was limitless in every way, present everywhere, had access to all knowledge and all wisdom and all power. One who is eternal, who exists outside of time as well as within time. One who is changeless, 
one who did not need anything to complete his happiness because he was perfectly happy, perfectly blessed. Everything he needed, he had within the Godhead itself, that perfect fellowship that he enjoyed with the members of the Godhead. Let's remember who this one is, who became one with us. Now, he took our nature. He became a man, which means he took on all of our limitations. You know how it is when, um, when you're young and you've got all this vitality, all this energy. There's so many things you can do. You can fall down and not get hurt so much. You can run and it doesn't make you ache. You don't pull tendons. And as you get older and older, you're eventually reduced to the point where there's very little you can do. And you look back to the days when you had all that strength and all that power. Well, what's it like to be the infinite God and then to take on the limitations of a man? That would be considerably more of, of a, as it were, uh, what would you say, um, well, uh, a condescension, a giving up, an emptying of oneself. He was limited to one place at a time. He became ignorant, and I have to say that guardedly, because Jesus came into the world knowing precisely what we know when we come into the world, which is nothing. Luke tells us that he grew in wisdom as well as in stature. Jesus had to learn like us. He became a man in every sense of the word. He became weak like us in Samaria. He was weary and he stood by the well. He had to live in time and not outside of it. He became subject to change. I mean, he certainly changed in many different ways. His states changed. Sometimes he was hungry, sometimes he wasn't. We think he perhaps even experienced our sicknesses. Um, certainly he got weak and tired and we know he also died. That's certainly a change. He needed food and water to sustain him for the first years of his life. He needed his parents' care to keep him alive. He became subject to hunger, sickness, injury, and death. The one who was unlimited took on our limitations, and that entails a degree of suffering. So that we don't misunderstand, by the way, remember as God, he was still in heaven, still had all of his divine attributes, he still was God in the fullest sense. He didn't give up any of these things. But in his human nature, in that man, Christ Jesus, he became like us in every way except he had no sin. Well, that's one way in which Jesus suffered. The second way is this. The one who was eternally blessed in heaven came into a sinful world. Paul writes in Ephesians 4 verse 9. Now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? This is not talking about Jesus going down into hell after he died on the cross. It's not even necessarily referring to his going into the tomb. But it means that the one who is from above, the eternal Son of God, descended into this world by the incarnation. But the world that he descended into is, is called the lower parts that is, it is a world that is under God's curse. And he lived among a people that apart from God's grace only hated him. Now Peter tells us in his second letter that when Lot lived in Sodom, his righteous soul was tormented day after day by the lawless deeds of those who lived around him. Now the men of Sodom were, were pretty wicked but if it was true of Lot that he was tormented in that kind of environment, how much more true would it be of Jesus who knowing, and by the way, I should mention, as he, as he grew, of course, and the Spirit of God was working with him, he was given a remembrance of, of what he experienced in heaven. And again, I realize this may sound a little bit strange because we often think of Jesus knowing everything. As a, as a baby developing in the womb, he knew the secrets of the universe and and all this type of thing, but we really need to understand that he had the full limitations of humanity. Otherwise, he could not say, as he did on one occasion, the day and the hour of Jesus coming in judgment against Jerusalem. No one knows, not the Son, not the angels, but the Father only. Jesus did not have access to his infinite divine knowledge. He took limitations upon himself. So he was uh, limited in, in that way. But again, um, 
Jesus remembered what it was like to be in heaven, and now he was on earth, and he was around these wicked men. And again, we may not think as people as being as wicked as they actually are because they are restrained, but Jesus knew it was in the hearts of all men. He knew it was in the hearts of the leaders. He knew they wanted to kill him for the things that he had done. So if it was true of Lot that he was tormented by the wickedness around him, how much more of this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose soul was perfect and who loved perfect righteousness. When Jesus told the truth, even those that belonged to him attacked him. When he did the right thing, he was accused of hypocrisy. When he healed on the Sabbath, he was accused of breaking the Sabbath and therefore worthy of death, or he was accused of being in league with the devil. This was the world that Jesus came into, the one whose soul is perfect and who enjoyed the perfect blessings of heaven. This is what he had to endure, and he was willing to do that. While he was here, he denied himself the comforts and the blessings that we take for granted, possessions and family. Jesus was not born into the family of a king. He didn't enjoy all the riches of the world. He was offered them, but he turned them down. He was born into a poor family. Peter writes in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now we know that Jesus became poor in many different ways, but certainly it was by giving up material possession. And obviously Jesus never married, even though marriage is a blessing, a blessing that he often gives to others. He was not married. He did not enjoy the blessings of marriage or of family. And throughout his ministry, all he owned was essentially the clothes on his back, the clothes that the soldiers actually gambled for at the foot of the cross. Jesus did not have the comforts and pleasures of this world. He chose instead to suffer. And then finally, as you know, the things we are more familiar with, one of his own disciples betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. He was put on trial and condemned by his own people. When he was handed over to the Romans, they ridiculed him, they beat him, they crucified him. And when he was on the cross, when our sins were charged to him, he endured what he sweat blood over in the garden as he was praying for the strength to be able to endure the Father's full wrath against our sins that were charged to him. And he died and he was buried. Now again, consider it would be difficult to endure these things if you were an ordinary man. It would be much more difficult to endure these things if you were a perfect man, if you had a righteous heart and you had done nothing wrong. But it's even more difficult for Jesus because not only was he perfect, but again, he remembered what it is that he had that he gave up in order to endure this, what it was like in heaven. Contrast heaven with this world, a world of perfect love, a world of perfect fellowship with the Father and with the Spirit. The presence of the holy angels, the perfect souls of those who were already there because of the work that Jesus was to do, yet he was willing to endure all these things out of his love for us. He was willing to suffer. Now finally, Jesus suffered, but he suffered patiently these things. And by the, word, the, the, by the way, the word Patient means long-suffering. Whenever we have to be patient, that means that we're having to endure something that is difficult, that causes a degree of suffering for a long period of time. Jesus endured these things patiently that he might bring us to heaven. Notice what Peter says in 2 mm, Peter or 1 Peter 2.23, And while being reviled, no, this is 1 Peter, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Now again, Jesus endured all these things, but look at the way that he endured them patiently, entrusting himself to the Lord, not retaliating. If somebody crosses us, we have a difficult time not wanting to get even with them. 
If they insult us, we want to insult them in return. If they injure us, we want to injure them in return. Jesus suffered all these things, and yet he did not return evil for evil. In other words, he didn't vent any wrath against them. He simply endured these things. When they insulted him, he did not insult in return. Remember what we read in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. When he suffered at their hands, he did not call upon the Father to destroy them. Remember what Jesus said on one occasion to his disciples when they tried to keep him from being arrested? He goes, don't you know that I could at any moment call down 12 legions of angels? But if I do that, how will the, the Father's will be accomplished? Jesus could have stopped it, but he didn't. He could have destroyed them, but he didn't. Instead, what did he do? He entrusted himself to the Father, and he prayed for those who hated and crucified him, that the Father might forgive them. Jesus knew that one day the Father was going to call these things into account, and every injustice was going to be corrected. It was either going to be corrected through his death on the cross, if they trusted in him, all their sins would be forgiven, or they would have to pay for them as they suffered forever in hell. All the wrongs would be made right. Now again, the point is this. This is what Jesus was willing to do for us. It required suffering, and he was willing to do it. He didn't do this for himself. He did this for us. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and chastened for, or, and, excuse me, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. I don't know if you notice this, but Isaiah is entering even into what the Jews were actually going to do to Jesus when he came. When he says, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We considered him cursed. And that's exactly the way the Jews considered him because when he was hung on the tree, Paul says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The reason why they hung him on there is because they considered him to be cursed of God. But the reason why he was nailed to the tree and he suffered all those things, he says, was for our transgressions, for our iniquities, for our well-being. Even though we were his enemies, while we were his enemies, God sent his son into the world in order to suffer and die to turn his enemies into friends. This is what Jesus did for us. He had to suffer and he had to die to bring, into the, to bring the kingdom in. And he had to do this in order to bring us into the kingdom, which is again why I would remind you, Jesus is the only way that anyone can enter into the kingdom of God, that anyone can enter into, into, uh, into heaven. He's the only way. So if you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't turned from your sins, you must do that in order to be saved. And I would invite you, in light of what we've just seen, to do that because Jesus suffered and died. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. But if you have trusted Jesus, then see again the depth of his love towards you and his sufferings to bring you into his kingdom. Jesus, as I've said before, in light of the suffering, now calls you to do the same, to advance the kingdom of heaven. And that is what we're going to be looking at this evening. But I do want to leave that with you. As we come to the table, as we prepare to come to the table, Jesus did this out of his love for you. He suffered and he died. That's, this is the only way it could happen.
And I would remind you, the only way the kingdom of heaven is going to advance is if we follow the example of Jesus and we are willing to suffer, even to die for his glory. Now, again, our suffering is going to be much broader than just the things that might happen to us if we do the will of God, but there are many things that we must patiently endure if the kingdom of heaven is to move forward. The example of Jesus is to encourage us to be willing to do that. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer, shall we? And let's not only ask the Lord to apply what we've just heard and to be willing to do what this calls us to do, but let's also prepare to come to the table and to remember the sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus.